everybody. Welcome to School Age Read Aloud. I'm Miss Rachel. Happy Friday. It's really great to see you all. We are reading Holes by Louis Sakar. It's great. I hope you all like it. We're going to start part two today, which begins with chapter 29. So if you aren't caught up with chapter 29, please go back and watch the videos. Share them with your friends. Um, I hope you all are enjoying our readings. I hope that you are visiting our website and looking for some resources and activities. Um, we've got games and eBooks, so you can read this book along with me if you want. Um, it's also the Summer of Adventure program. So if you have the ability to go to denverlibraryadventures.org, you can sign up and we will send you prizes. Um, let's see what else is going on. Our Facebook page has some cool stuff on it. Our YouTube channel has some cool stuff on it. You guys already know about that. Uh, let's see. What happened in our book last time? Whew, a lot, a lot happened. Let's see. We went 110 years into the past and we found out why Kissing Kate Barlow became a bandit. She loved a man and he was killed. She loved a black man and the white town killed him and she became a bandit and killed the sheriff and buried her treasure in the desert. It was very exciting. Um, what else has happened? Stanley is teaching Zero how to read. Um, oh, and we found out that Zero's real name is Hector Zeroni. The same last name as Madame Zeroni, who Stanley's no good pig stealing great great grandfather was supposed to carry up a mountain. Um, should we just get started? Let's just jump right in. Let's see. Part two The Last Hole. Chapter 29. There was a change in the weather for the worse. The air became unbearably humid. Stanley was drenched in sweat. Beads of moisture ran down the handle of his shovel. It was almost as if the temperature had gotten so hot that the air itself was sweating. A loud boom of thunder echoed across the empty lake. A storm was way off to the west, beyond the mountains. Stanley could count more than 30 seconds between the flash of lightning and the clap of thunder. That was how far away the storm was. Sound travels a great distance across a barren wasteland. Usually, Stanley couldn't see the mountains at this time of day. The only time they were visible was at sunup before the air became hazy. However, now the sky was very dark off to the west and every time the lightning flashed, the dark shape of the mountains would briefly appear. Come on, rain, screamed Armpit. Blow this way. Maybe it'll rain so hard it will fill up the whole lake, said Squid. We can go swimming. Forty days and forty nights, said X-Ray. Guess we'd better start building us an ark. Get two of each animal, right? Right, said Zigzag. Two rattlesnakes, two scorpions, two yellow spotted lizards. The humidity or maybe the electricity in the air had made Zigzag's head even more wild looking. His frizzy blonde hair stuck almost straight out. The horizon lit up with a huge web of lightning. In that split second, Stanley thought he saw an unusual rock formation on top of one of the mountain peaks. The peak looked to him exactly like a giant fist with the thumb sticking straight up. And then it was gone. And Stanley wasn't sure whether he'd seen it or not. I found refuge on God's thumb. That was what his great-grandfather had supposedly said after Kate Barlow had robbed him and left him stranded in the desert. No one ever knew what he meant by that. He was delirious when they found him. He was delirious when he said it. How could he live for three weeks without food or water? Stanley had asked his father. I don't know. 
I wasn't there, replied his father. I wasn't born yet. My father wasn't born yet. My grandmother, your great-grandmother, was a nurse at the hospital where they treated him. He'd always talked about how she dabbed his forehead with a cool, wet cloth. He said that's why he fell in love with her. He thought she was an angel. A real angel? His father didn't know. What about after he got better? Did he ever say what he meant by God's thumb or how he survived? No, he just blamed his no good pig stealing father. The storm moved off farther west along with any hope of rain. But the image of the fist and thumb remained in Stanley's head. Although instead of lightning flashing behind the thumb, in Stanley's mind, the lightning was coming out of the thumb as if it were the thumb of God. Chapter 30. The next day was Zigzag's birthday, or so he said. Zigzag lay in his cot as everyone headed outside. I get to sleep in because it's my birthday. Then a little while later, he cut into the breakfast line just in front of Squid. Squid told him to go to the end of the line. Hey, it's my birthday, Zigzag said, staying where he, where he was. It's not your birthday, said Magnet, who was standing behind Squid. Is too, said Zigzag, July 8. Stanley was behind Magnet. He didn't know what day of the week it was, let alone the date. It could have been July 8. But... How would Zigzag know? He tried to figure out how long he'd been at Camp Green Lake, if indeed it was July 8th. I came here on May 24th, he said aloud. So that means I've been here 46 days, said Zero. Stanley was still trying to remember how many days there were in May and June. He looked at Zero. He learned not to doubt him when it came to math. 46 days. It felt more like a thousand. He didn't dig a hole that first day, and he hadn't dug a hole yet today. That meant he dug 44 holes, if it really was July 8. Can I have an extra carton of juice? Zigzag asked Mr. Sir. It's my birthday. To everyone's surprise, Mr. Sir gave it to him. Stanley dug his shovel into the dirt, hole number 45. The 45th hole is the hardest, Stanley told himself. But that really wasn't true, and he knew it. He was a lot stronger than when he first arrived. His body had adjusted somewhat to the heat and, heart con and harsh conditions. Mr. Sir was no longer depriving him of water. After having to get by on less water for a week or so, Stanley now felt like he had all the water he could want. Of course, it helped that Zero dug some of his hole for him each day, but that wasn't as great as everyone thought it was. He always felt awkward while Zero was digging his hole, unsure of what to do with himself. Usually he stood around a while before sitting off by himself on the hard ground with the sun beating down on him. It was better than digging, but not a lot better. When the sun came up a couple hours later, Stanley looked for the thumb of God. The mountains were little more than dark shadows on the horizon. He thought he could make out a spot where the top of one mountain seemed to jut upward, but it didn't seem very impressive. A short time later, the mountains were no longer visible, hidden behind the glare of the sun, reflecting off the dirty air. It was possible, he realized, that he was somewhere near where Kate Barlow had robbed his great-grandfather. If that was really her lipstick tube he'd found, then she must have lived somewhere around here. Zero took his turn before the lunch break. Stanley climbed out of his hole and Zero climbed down into it. Hey, caveman, said Zigzag, you should get a whip. Then if your slave doesn't dig fast enough, you can crack it across his back. He's not my slave, said Stanley. We have a deal, that's all. 
A good deal for you, said Zigzag. It was Zero's idea, not mine. Don't you know, Zig? said X-Ray, coming over. Caveman's doing Zero a big favor. Zero likes to dig holes. He sure is a nice guy to let Zero dig his hole for him, said Squid. Well, what about me? asked Armpit. I like to dig holes, too. Can I dig for you, Caveman, after Zero's finished? The other boys laughed. No, I want to, said Zigzag. It's my birthday. Stanley tried his best to ignore them. Zigzag kept at it. Come on, Caveman, be a pal. Let me dig your hole. Stanley smiled as if it were all a big joke. When Mr. Pendansky arrived with water and lunch, Zigzag offered Stanley his place in line. Since you're so much better than me, Stanley remained where he was. I didn't say I was better. You're insulting him, Zig, said X-Ray. Why should Caveman take your place when he deserves to be at the very front? He's better than all of us, aren't you, Caveman? No said Stanley. Sure you are, said X-Ray. Now come to the front of the line where you belong. That's okay, said Stanley. No, it's not okay, said X-Ray. Get up here. Stanley hesitated, then moved to the front of the line. Well, this is a first, Mr. Pendansky said, coming around to the side of the truck. He filled Stanley's canteen and handed him a sack lunch. Stanley was glad to get away. He sat down between his hole and Zero's. He was glad that he'd be digging his own hole for the rest of the day. Maybe the other boys would leave him alone. Maybe he shouldn't let Zero dig his hole for him anymore, but he needed to save his energy to be a good teacher. He bit into his sandwich. It contained some kind of meat and cheese mixture that came in a can. Just about everything at Camp Green Lake came in a can. The supply truck came once a month. He glanced up to see Zigzag and Squid walking towards him. I'll give you my cookie if you let me dig your hole, said Zigzag. Squid laughed. Here, take my cookie, said Zigzag, holding it out for him. No thanks, said Stanley. Come on, take my cookie, said Zigzag, sticking it in his face. Leave me alone, said Stanley. Please eat my cookie, said Zigzag, holding it under Stanley's nose. Squid laughed. Stanley pushed it away. Zigzag pushed him back. Don't push me. I didn't. Stanley got to his feet. He looked around. Mr. Pendansky was filling Zero's canteen. Zigzag pushed him again. I said, don't push me. Stanley took a step backwards, carefully avoiding Zero's hole. Zigzag kept after him. He shoved Stanley and said, quit pushing. Lay off, said Armpit as he, Magnet, and X-Ray joined them. Why should he, snapped X-Ray. Caveman's bigger. He can take care of himself. I don't want any trouble, Stanley said. Zigzag pushed him hard. Eat my cookie, he said. Stanley was glad to see Mr. Pendansky coming towards them, along with Zero. Hi, Mom, said Armpit. We're just fooling around. I saw what was going on, Mr. Pendansky said. He turned to Stanley. Go ahead, Stanley, he said. Hit him back. You're bigger. Stanley stared at Mr. Pendansky in astonishment. Teach the bully a lesson, said Mr. Pendansky. Zigzag hit Stanley on the shoulder with his open hand. Teach me a lesson, he challenged. Stanley made a feeble attempt to punch Zigzag. Then he felt a flurry of fists against his head and neck. Zigzag had hold of his collar with one hand and was hitting him with the other. The collar ripped and Stanley fell backwards onto the dirt. That's enough, Mr. Pendansky yelled. It wasn't enough for Zigzag. He jumped on top of Stanley. Stop, shouted Mr. Pendansky. 
The side of Stanley's face was pressed flat against the dirt. He tried to protect himself, but Zigzag's fist slammed off his arms and pounded his face into the ground. All he could do was wait for it to be over. Then, suddenly, Zigzag was off of him. Stanley managed to look up, and he saw that Zero had his arm around Zigzag's long neck. Zigzag made a gagging sound as he desperately tried to pry Zero's arm off of him. You're going to kill him, shouted Mr. Pendansky. Zero kept squeezing. Armpit charged into them, freeing Zigzag from Zero's chokehold. The three boys fell to the ground in different directions. Mr. Pendansky fired his pistol into the air. The other counselors came running from the office. The tents, or out on the lake, they had their guns drawn, but holstered them when they saw the trouble was over. The warden walked over from her cabin. There was a riot, Mr. Pendansky told her. Zero almost strangled Ricky. The warden looked at Zigzag, who was still stretching and massaging his neck. Then she turned her attention to Stanley, who was obviously in the worst condition. What happened to you? Nothing. It wasn't a riot. Ziggy was beating up the caveman, said Armpit. Then Zero started choking Zigzag, and I had to pull Zero off of Zigzag. It was all over before Mom fired his gun. They just got a little hot, that's all, said X-Ray. You know how it is in the sun all day. People get hot, right? But everything's cool now. I see, the warden said. She turned to Zigzag. What's the matter? Didn't you get a puppy for your birthday? Zig's just a little hot, said X-Ray. Out in the sun all day, you know how it is. The blood starts to boil. Is that what happened, Zigzag? asked the warden. Yeah, said Zigzag. Like X-Ray said, working so hard in the hot sun while caveman just sits around doing nothing, my blood boiled. Excuse me? said the warden. Caveman digs his holes just like everybody else. Zigzag shrugged. Sometimes. Excuse me? Zero's been digging part of Caveman's hole every day, said Squid. The warden looked from Squid to Stanley to Zero. I'm teaching him to read and write, said Stanley. It's sort of a trade. The hole still gets dug, so what does it matter who digs it? Excuse me, said the warden. Isn't it more important for him to learn to read, Stanley asked. Doesn't that build character more than digging holes? That's his character, said the warden. What about your character? Stanley raised and lowered one shoulder. The warden turned to Zero. Well, Zero, what have you learned so far? Zero said nothing. Have you just been digging caveman's hole for nothing? The warden asked him. He likes to dig holes said Mr. Pendansky. Tell me what you learned yesterday, said the warden. Surely you can remember that. Zero said nothing. Mr. Pendansky laughed. He picked up a shovel and said, you might as well try to teach this shovel to read. It's got more brains than zero. The at sound, said Zero. The at sound, repeated the warden. Well then, tell me, what does C-A-T spell? Zero glanced around uneasily. Stanley knew he knew the answer. Zero just didn't like answering questions. Cat, Zero said. Mr. Pendansky clapped his hands. Bravo, bravo, the boy's a genius. F-A-T, asked the warden. Zero thought for a moment. Stanley hadn't taught him the f sound yet. F. f. Zero whispered. F. Fat. Fat. How about H A T? asked the warden. Stanley hadn't taught him the H sound either. 
zero concentrated hard, then said, chat. All the counselors laughed. He's a genius, all right, said Mr. Pendansky. He's so stupid, he doesn't even know he's stupid. Stanley didn't know why Mr. Pendansky seemed to have it in for zero. If Mr. Pendansky only thought about it, he'd realize it was very logical for zero to think that the letter H made a ch sound. Okay, from now on, I don't want anyone digging anyone else's hole, said the warden. And no more reading lessons. I'm not digging another hole, said Zero. Good, said the warden. She turned to Stanley. You know why you're digging holes? Because it's good for you. It teaches you a lesson. If Zero digs your hole for you, then you're not learning your lesson, are you? I guess not, Stanley mumbled, though he knew they weren't digging just to learn a lesson. She was looking for something, something that belonged to Kiss and Kate Barlow. Why can't I dig my own hole but still teach Zero to read, he asked. What's wrong with that? I'll tell you what's wrong with that the warden said. It leads to trouble. Zero almost killed Zigzag. It causes him stress, said Mr. Pendansky. I know you mean well, Stanley, but face it, Zero's too stupid to learn to read. That's what makes his blood boil, not the hot sun. I'm not digging another hole, said Zero. Mr. Pendansky handed the hitch. Sh- Mr. Pendansky handed him the shovel. Here, take it, Zero. It's all you'll ever be good for. Zero took the shovel. Then he swung it like a baseball bat. The metal blade smashed across Mr. Pendansky's face. His knees crumpled beneath him. He was unconscious before he hit the ground. The counselors all drew their guns. Zero held the shovel out in front of him as if he were going to try to bat away the bullets. I hate digging holes, he said. Then he slowly backed away. Don't shoot him, said the warden. He can't go anywhere. The last thing we need is an investigation. Zero kept backing up. Out past the cluster of holes the boys had been digging, then farther and farther out onto the lake. He's going to have to come back for water, the warden said. Stanley noticed Zero's canteen lying on the ground near his hole. A couple of the counselors helped Mr. Pendansky to his feet and into the truck. Stanley looked out towards Zero, but he had disappeared into the haze. The warden ordered the counselors to take turns guarding the shower room and rec room all day and all night. They were not to let Zero drink any water. When he returned, he was to be brought directly to her. She examined her fingernails and said, It's almost time for me to paint my nails again. Before she left, she told the six remaining members of Group D that she still expected seven holes. Um, how do you guys feel about that? Um, how do you feel about the way Mr. Pandansky treats Zero? Not great, huh? Do you think that Zero should have hit him across the face with a shovel? How's he gonna survive in the desert without any water? Let's find out. Chapter 31. Stanley angrily dug his shovel into the dirt. He was angry at everyone, Mr. Pendansky, the warden, Zigzag, X-Ray, and his no-good, dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-great-grandfather. But mostly, he was angry at himself. He knew he should never have let Zero dig part of his hole for him. He still could have taught him to read. If Zero could dig all day and still have the strength to learn, then he should have been able to dig all day and still have the strength to teach. What he should do, he thought, was go after Zero. But he didn't. 
None of the others helped him dig Zero's hole, and he didn't expect them to. Zero had been helping him dig his hole. Now he had to dig Zero's. He remained out on the lake digging during the hottest part of the day, long after everyone else had gone in. He kept an eye out for Zero, but Zero didn't come back. It would have been easy to go out after Zero. There was nobody to stop him. He kept thinking that's what he should do. Maybe he could climb to the top of Big Thumb. If it wasn't too far away, and if it was really the same place where his great-grandfather found refuge, and if, after a hundred years or so, water was still there. It didn't seem likely. Not when an entire lake had gone dry. And even if they did find refuge on Big Thumb, he thought, they'd still have to come back here eventually. Then they'd both have to face the warden and her rattlesnake fingers. Instead, he came up with a better idea, although he didn't have it quite all figured out yet. He thought that maybe he could make a deal with the warden. He'd tell her where he really found the gold tube if she wouldn't scratch Zero. He wasn't sure how he'd make this deal without getting himself in deeper trouble. She might just say, tell me where you found it or I'll scratch you too. Plus, it would mean X-Ray would get in trouble too. She'd probably scratch him up as well. X-Ray would be out to get him for the next 16 months. He dug his shovel into the dirt. By the next morning, Zero still hadn't returned. Stanley saw one of the counselors sitting guard by the water spigot outside the shower wall. Mr. Pendansky had two black eyes and a bandage over his nose. I always knew he was stupid, Stanley heard him say. Stanley was required to dig only one hole the next day. As he dug, he kept a constant watch out for Zero, but never saw him. Once again, he considered going out on the lake to look for him, but he began to realize that it was already too late. His only hope was that Zero had found God's thumb on his own. It wasn't impossible. His great-grandfather had found it. For some reason, his great-grandfather had felt the urge to climb to the top of that mountain. Maybe Zero would feel the same urge if it was the same mountain if the water was still there. He tried to convince himself it wasn't impossible. There had been a storm just a few days ago. Maybe Big Thumb was actually some kind of natural water tower that caught and stored the rain. It wasn't impossible. He returned to his tent to find the warden, Mr. Sir, and Mr. Pendansky all waiting for him. Have you seen Zero? The warden asked him. No. No sign of him at all? No. Do you have any idea where he went? No. You know you're not doing him any favors if you're lying, said Mr. Sir. He can't survive out there for more than a day or two. I don't know where he is. All three stared at Stanley as if trying to figure out if he was telling the truth. Mr. Pendansky's face was so swollen he could barely open his eyes. They were just slits. You sure he has no family? The warden asked Mr. Pendansky. He's a ward of the state, Mr. Pendansky told her. He was living on the streets when he was arrested. Is there anyone who might ask questions? Some social worker who took an interest in him? He had nobody, said Mr. Pendansky. He was nobody. The warden thought a moment. Okay, I want you to destroy all of his records. Mr. Pendansky nodded. He was never here, said the warden. Mr. Sir nodded. Can you get into the state files on your computer? She asked Mr. Pendansky. I don't want anyone in the AG's office to know he was here. 
I don't think I can erase him completely from all the state files, said Mr. Pendansky. Too many cross-references, but I can make it so it would be very difficult for anyone to ever find a record of him. Like I said, though, no one will ever look. No one cares about Hector Zeroni. Good, said the warden. And we're going to end there. And we will start with chapter 32 on Monday. I hope you all have a fabulous weekend. I hope that you're enjoying our book. I hope it's making you think. I hope it's making you imagine. I hope that you're having some conversations with your siblings or your adults or your friends or whoever you live with um, about the book. I hope it's making you talk. Um, I hope you have a great day and weekend, and I will see you on Monday, and we will start with chapter 32 of Holes. <laughs>